Hey everyone, um, so in this lecture, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the concepts we covered in class and try to clarify some issues which I think I would find confusing. Um, and then um, add some, or, or go over some additional concepts from the book and go through an example. So uh, that's the agenda. Let me see if I can get our screen share going. Good deal. Okay, so um, remember in class we talked about this problem where we have two sources of water, um, maybe two reservoirs, uh, source A and source B, and they're connected by pipelines to a pump station, um, which then pumps the water to city C, and from there whatever's left gets pumped to city D. And we were interested in understanding, you know, situations under which either city C or city D get um, essentially uh, a loss of water supply based on, um, you know, certain events, like for example, the failure of um, one of these pipelines, branch one would be E1, uh, failure of branch two would be E2, and so on, so on. And let's look at one specific um, question that we looked at. Uh, we were asked, using set theory, to find the conditions under which there was a shortage of water in city C. In case you're wondering, that's my uh, dog uh, drinking. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that's his commentary on this. He's like, hey, there's no shortage of water. It's just right here in the bowl. Um, but anyway, back to the question. So we wanted to find the conditions under which um, water or city C runs out of water. And one of you guys asked, well, you know, what do you mean by shortage? What we really mean is that there's a loss of water supply. So it's not really shortage. It's a complete loss of water supply. And we talked about this and concluded that this really could occur um, in one of two ways. You could have um, essentially failure of both branches one and two, which would then cut off supply to uh, the station and pipeline three, uh, or you could have failure of, um, of branch three. Actually, it could be and or, but anyway, we, we stick with that or terminology because it, I think, is um, clarifying. And so we write that um, mathematically, as we say, okay, so we essentially require that both event one and two occur simultaneously. That would be our one potential event that would result in loss of water to city C. Um, or, and that would be the union, we could have um, a break or a disruption in um, the third branch, and that would be E3. And then we could also write that just as E1, E2 here, um, essentially replacing the intersection sign with a multiplication. So that's just terminology. Um, now, the question that I want to raise is, um, did we mess this up? Uh, because, in fact, um, you know, event one intersect event two is really a new event. It's an event in which both branches fail simultaneously, right? And so it might make more sense to put an association between them and then union that with E3 and ignore the dots there. I have no idea whether they're there. <laughs> I must have messed up my uh, math type. But anyway, so, so this might be a more, um, you know, sort of careful or explicit way of writing out the same scenario where we're really very carefully delineating the fact that events one and two um, have to essentially occur simultaneously together, and then that would be um, then unioned with the C3. And again, we could write that intersection as just E1 times E2. Um, and so really the issue is, in kind of a broader context is, and one of you guys asked this, does the order um, or the way that we associate these um, events matter? And the an answer is that sometimes it doesn't and sometimes it does, right? So um, let's look at a couple cases where it doesn't really matter. So here we have a situation where we're unioning E1 and E2, and it really doesn't matter if we put an association there or not, um, because we get exactly the same event if we write it in this way, this way, or if we switch the order. Here's another case where it doesn't matter. Um, so we essentially have a union of three events, E1, E2, and E3. Uh, if we associate the first two um, and then union that with E3, we can use the distributive rule to bring E3 inside if we want to be really um, careful about it. And uh, then we're, what we're really saying is that we have one event, which is the, um, the union of E1 and E3. In other words, um, either E1 occurs or E3 occurs, or that's the second union, um, 
E2 or E3 occurs. In both cases, we have the or E3, right? So it's already accounted for once. We've just kind of been a little redundant. So no reason to keep it. We can just drop it. So we're kind of right back to where we started without the association. Um, and likewise, we can change the order up, right? It doesn't really matter uh, which order we, we union. Uh, it all means the same thing. But here's a case where actually order matters a lot. Um, and so we would have totally gotten the wrong answer if we hadn't tracked the order. So in this case, we're talking about a new event indicated by the association uh, in which E1 is union with E2, and that new event is then intersected with E3. Now note, this is very similar to what we wrote down for the pipeline problem. I'm gonna go back to the pipeline problem for a second. So what we wrote down for the pipeline problem was the intersection of event one and two union with E3. And we said it didn't matter whether we had that association there or not. Um, and I'm gonna tell you the reason it doesn't matter in this case is because um, just like for arithmetic, um, there's a sort of an order of operations rule for sets too. So, uh, and that is basically that you carry out intersections before you carry out unions. Just like in arithmetic, you carry out multiplications before you carry out additions. And so in this case, because of that order of operations rule, whether we put the association here or not, we would always um, uh, intersect E1 and E2 first before we then unioned with E3. So it really didn't matter whether this association was here or not, the order of operation would require the same evaluation. But that's not true in this case, because um, you can see now we've got the union here if we didn't have this association, it would be very different. So here's the um, sort of equivalent uh, event without the association written. And you can see it's gonna be different because, because the order of operation requires us to evaluate E2 intersect E3 first and then union it with E1. And that's very likely to be different than the union of E1 and E2 intersected with E3. And let me just show you that graphically. Um, so my claim is that, that the left-hand side does not equal the right-hand side, right? And so let's look at the left-hand side. It's shown here. Um, so first, considered e un E1 union E2. E1, in this case, is represented by a circle, E2 by a square, E3 by a triangle, all contained within a sample space, which is that larger square. And I should get my laser pointer out, I guess, actually, shouldn't I? Um, and so if I'm thinking about E1 union E2, basically that's gonna be all of the area encompassed by the circle and also by the square. So those two areas combined. And then I intersect it with E3, that it's gonna be the portion of that area in E1 and E2 that is also contained within E3, which is shown by this yellow bit here, okay? So that's, that is the meaning, so graphically or geometrically speaking, of this statement. Uh, E1 union E2 associated, and then intersect E3. What about this other, the right-hand side, um, E1 union E2 intersect E3. Now we have to, by order of operation, first evaluate the intersection of E2 and E3. Uh, intersection of E2 and E3 is going to be um, where the triangle and the square overlap. So it's going to be a chunk of that yellow. And then we union that with E1, which is all of the, uh, the circle. So this statement corresponds to the region in yellow here. And if we compare them, they're clearly not the same, right? So, so if we hadn't put the association here, we would have gotten absolutely the wrong answer. So um, it's, it's in general, I think you, you should be careful if you're working with problems which have both unions and intersections, it's probably a good idea to use the associations just to make sure that, um, that you don't run into this problem. Okay, so um, coming back to the lecture uh, that we had today, so some of the um, key results we talked about are shown here, that basically if you have a, um, an event E, um, which is contained within um, a possibility space S, that event has a probability that ranges between zero and one. One is 100% uh, likely, and that would correspond to the probability, or the case where the event is the sample space, and zero meaning that uh, it's essentially the null event. Uh, it's just not gonna happen. Um, and then we had some rules for uh, uh, addition of various kinds of events. This is one of them. 
Um, so if you have an event unioned with its complement, um, and you want to know the probability of that, um, well, you know it's one, right? Because the event unioned with the complement is simply the uh, entire sample space. So this thing is equal to one. Um, but we'd like to know, you know, what the uh, addition rule says. Well, because event E and its complement are mutually exclusive, uh, we can write this probability of their union as the sum of the probabilities. So P E probability of E plus the probability of E bar, and of course that equals one, which gives us this nice little formula here, which is that the probability of the complement of an event is equal to one minus the probability of an event. So that's kind of, you know, like we talked about, if you had a 30% chance of coming to class today, then there's a 70% chance that you won't come to class. It's a useful little um, result to have in your back pocket. Makes perfect sense, but it's nice to show it mathematically. And um, in general, if you have two mutually exclusive events, E1 and E2, um, the probability of their union is just going to be the, the sum um, of uh, the individual the probability of the individual events. And that is true for um, any number of mutually exclusive events. So we could have um, n mutually exclusive events. If we take their union and we want to know the probability, it's simply the probability of the sum of those uh, events. Uh, it gets more complicated if we're talking about non-mutually exclusive events. So these are events which have some intersection. Um, and in that case, we have, um, a, say, two events, E1 and E2, which, um, which are uh, non-mutually exclusive. Um, basically, and I'll show you that in a second, we talked about it already, uh, if we just summed up the probability of the individual events, we'd have too much probability because we've double counted their intersection. And you can kind of see that here, where uh, the probability of E1 is represented by this ellipse. Um, probability of E2 is going to be the area associated with the second ellipse. And if we just sum those two areas, we would end up counting this overlap or intersection area twice. And that's why we have to subtract off that, that intersection piece. Um, yeah, so basically this is repeating what I just said, that if you have mutually exclusive events, you can just um, uh, sum up their individual probabilities. Um, if you've got three non-mutually exclusive events, it gets a little bit more complicated. So um, now we have the problem we're interested in the probability of three mutually exclusive, the union of three uh, mutually exclusive events. Um, it's going to be the probability of the three events individually um, minus the various combinations of uh, overlap to account for the fact that we would um, overestimate uh, the probability. But then we've taken off too much, and so we have to add back the probability of the triple intersection between events one, two, and three. And that may be a little bit in not intuitive, but you can actually derive the result uh, as shown here. So this is the result we're looking for. Um, basically, you start with um, the left-hand side, probability of event one, union event two, union event three. So that's what we want to have a formula for. Um, and then we simply um, associate event one and two. There's no reason we can't do that um, when we're talking about unions. And so really now we can think of this as the probability of two events union together, right? Um, one of the events is this E1 union E2, and the other event is union E3. And so now we can apply the, um, the addition rule for non two non-exclusive events to this probability. So that's going to be the probability of this uh, unioned event plus the probability of E3 minus the probability of their intersection. Okay, so far so good. Um, and so then uh, we can further simplify this for uh, the first term on the right-hand side. The probability of um, E1 and E2 uh, can be written, again, using the addition rule as the probability of E1 plus the probability of E2 minus the probability of their uh, cross product, E1 and E2. That's fine. And then we're left with this term here. So we've got the probability of E1 union E2 intersect E3. And we can distribute uh, E3 through. And so if we do that, uh, we're going to end up with the probability of E1 intersected with E3 unioned with E2 intersected with E3. OK, so we're making some progress. So far, everything looks good here. It's just we've got this uh, kind of weird term we need to work on now. And we can apply the addition rule to this too, right? Because it's really just two events union together, and we want the probability of them. And so let's just 
bracket the result of that, it's going to be the probability of E1, E3 plus the probability of E2, E3 minus the probability of their um, cross product, which in this case is E1, E2, and E3. And then if you distribute that negative sign through, you get the final result, which exactly equals our rule up here. So there's the proof. Um, and if you're interested in n events, so not just three events, um, the addition rule of n non-mutually exclusive events um, gets incredibly complicated if we present it the way that we just did. And so it's easier to represent it in this way, where we just say it's equal to the probability of the union of all those events, 1 through n, is 1 minus the probability of the intersection of their complements. So uh, another good rule to have. And the, the proof is actually uh, fairly straightforward. We just simply use this um, little rule we talked about before, um, where the probability of a complement of event is equal to 1 minus the probability of the event itself. Um, so we start with the left-hand side, the probability of uh, E1 union with E2 up through EN. Um, and so if we apply this complement rule, we can basically rewrite this left-hand side as 1 minus the probability of the complement of this whole thing, which is just a big event, right? So it's going to be the complement of all of these guys here. And now we apply our favorite De Morgan's rule to um, essentially change the, um, the uh, union of the events in a complement to the intersection of the complements. And so we end up with um, this term becoming this term. And if you look at it, that's exactly uh, where we started. So that proves the, uh, the contention. All right, so now let's go through an example, and, uh, and then I'll conclude the lecture. So um, this is example 2.13 in the textbook, but it's, uh, it's sort of made a little bit, maybe a little bit more relevant um, to the class. So we're going to continue consider two juniors in, in CE 11. And after we think a little bit about their chances of graduating, at the end of next year, we settle on the following three possibilities. Uh, the possibility A is they're definitely going to graduate, one of them. Um, and, and really, we're, we're talking about the individuals. So, um, so individuals, say this first individual here, um, this individual could either be in a state A where they're definitely going to graduate, depending on the grades and how many classes they've taken. Um, they could be in a state B where the graduation is questionable, or they could be in a state C where they're definitely not going to graduate, right? And so these three states could apply to both of these students. So that's a key point to remember. And so our first task is to describe the sample space for this problem using the notation AA to denote that both students will definitely graduate, AB to denote that the first student will definitely graduate, but the graduation of the second student is questionable and so forth. So basically, these um, two letters then are going to indicate the state of these two students relative to these three possible outcomes. And our task two then is to identify within the sampling space um, the events corresponding to the following two situations. Event one is going to be the case where the first student will definitely graduate next year, and event two is the case where the second student will uh, definitely graduate next year. I'm sorry about the overlap there. Yeah, there it is. So event two is the case where the second student will definitely graduate next year. All right. So those are our two tasks. Let's start with task one. Here it is. So we start, we draw a box, which represents our sample space. That's the overall box with the S. And now we want to define all the possible states that these two, two students could be in. Well, I mean, clearly, they could both definitely graduate. That would be AA. Um, the second student might, um, graduation might be questionable, or the second student um, may definitely not graduate while the first student is definitely going to graduate. So that would be this first column here, um, and then so forth and so on. So in the rows, basically, we can imagine a case where um, the second student definitely graduates, second student um, may or may not graduate, the uh, second student is definitely not going to graduate. So there you go. That's the sample space. We've got nine different possible states that we have to keep track of. Um, and then the second task we were asked to, to um, uh, follow up on was to identify the region of the sample space corresponding to these two events. E1 is that the first student will definitely graduate next year. Um, well, if we look at the uh, uh, 
sort of states where the first student definitely graduates essentially corresponds to this first column. So that would be our event one within the sample space is this first column here. Um, and then event two is the case where the second student definitely graduates, and that's going to be the first row. And so uh, E2 then is going to be just the first row of the sample space. One of the things I want to point out is that um, E1 and E2 are not mutually exclusive because they have some intersection. That is, there is an intersection point here where both of them graduate. And uh, that can become important if we apply the addition rule as we will uh, in a minute. Task three, assuming that each of the states are equally likely, that is the probability of each state or event is one ninth, calculate the probability that at least one of the students will definitely graduate next year. So one of the students will definitely graduate next year. And if we think about it, then we're really asking for um, the probability uh, of the union between event one, which is the first student definitely graduates, um, and, or, really or, right, union of E1 um, and E2, which is the second student will definitely graduate. So we're basically saying, what is the probability that either the first student definitely graduates or the second student definitely graduates? Now, we want the probability of a union. We can employ the addition rule, but we already noted that E1 and E2 are not mutually exclusive. And so that means we have to use the form of the addition rule, which has this cross term subtracted out. Um, and if we go back to what are the probabilities of the uh, two events, so basically uh, event one has three states in it, um, equally likely one ninth probability, that means there's gonna be three ninths uh, here, and then also event two has three ninth probability associated with it. And so basically we assign three ninth probability to the event one, three ninth probability to event two, and then we have to subtract out the uh, intersection of E1 and E2, which remember is in the upper corner here, at the left corner. And so that leaves us taking off in one ninth. And so we're finally left with the probability of this uh, event of um, at least um, one of the students definitely graduating this year as five ninths. It's a little bit over 50% probability that at least one of the students will graduate this year. Um, we, you know, we could have done this a little bit more brute force, right? We could have just said, hey, look, um, I can go through and count all the cases where, um, you know, E1 unions E2, and then just add up the number of these um, uh, events and multiply by one ninth to get five ninths. So that's true. But it's really nice to use the math of it because there are going to be situations where we can't brute force it. And so, um, but anyway, that's certainly in this case, we can do it either way. So task four is to calculate the probability that only one of the students will definitely graduate next year. So that means that the other student could, um, you know, have a situation where their graduation is uh, unlikely or it could be that the second student um, actually uh, will not graduate. So there's actually two states associated with the second student, but only one state associated with uh, the first student, which is that they graduate. And the other issue is that the student that graduates could either be the first student or the second student. So, you know, we don't, they're not stipulating which of the students uh, definitely graduates. And so what does that work out to mathematically? Basically, we're looking for the probability that in, say, in this case, the first student definitely graduates, but then E2 complement means that the second student um, does not definitely graduate. It's a little bit tricky, does not definitely graduate, which means that that second student may graduate, outcome is uncertain, or definitely will not graduate. But anyway, that's designated as E2 complement. And likewise, we're gonna union that because it, the second student may be the, the winner here. The second student may be the one that definitely graduates, whereas the first student may be the one that does not definitely graduate, so E1 complement. And um, if we think about it, these are mutually exclusive because, um, because almost by definition, right, we calculate, we want to calculate the probability that only one of the students would definitely graduate. So if one of the students definitely graduates and the other student will not definitely graduate by definition of this um, set of probabilities or events. And so that means we can use the addition rule without the cross term. And uh, so we just simply uh, take the probability of their union as the sum of the probabilities of the uh, individual events. And then if we look back at, um, or actually look forward 
at what the probability is associated with these events. Let's do that now. So um, the probability that the first student will definitely graduate, but the second student will not definitely graduate is calculated as follows. So the, um, the, uh, the event one where the first student definitely graduates is gonna be the pink region. So in each of these states, the first student is definitely graduating. Um, the situation where the second student does not definitely graduate is going to exclude all of the sample space included in the first row because the second student definitely graduates in that case. So it's gonna be this blue box. And the intersection of E1 and E2 bar is just gonna be um, a set intersection of the pink with the blue, which is this yellow region here. And we can see we've got two events in that, so that's two out of nine. Um, and so that's, that's our probability of uh, this first case. And likewise, it's not a surprise that the second um, probability is gonna be two nines two. I can show that really quickly. Um, so in this case, the second student definitely graduates. So that's, we're really talking about E2 being the first row here. And then um, the first student does not definitely graduate, which is going to exclude the first column. So that's the blue region here and their intersection, E1 bar, E2 is the yellow. And again, we have two events um, in that overall sample space. And so that's why we've got the second two nights. So we add them together and it's four nights. So the probability that only one of the students will definitely graduate next year is a little bit less than 50%. So we can see depending on how we ask the question, we actually get different results. And I think, uh, okay, I believe that's it. So um, I just wanted to say one last thing, which is that just like before, you know, we could have gone through and analyzed all the different scenarios under which um, this statement is true and concluded that the probability had to be four ninths. But, um, but you know, that's dangerous because we could easily miss um, a couple of combinations. And so again, the, you know, going the math route is probably the better way to go. And with that, I'm done and uh, hope you enjoyed the lecture. See you later.